Bismillah. I'm just testing the microphone. If I have to wear this or not. You know, this seems to be very indicative of Southern California. Every masjid in Southern California has these. So, <coughs> Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu was Salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala Alihi wa Ashabihi, wa man wala huwa bad, Allahumma alimna ma yunfauna, wa infauna bi ma alamtana. Wazidna ilm and Yarab al Alameen. O Allah, teach us, with what, with, teach us what will benefit us and benefit us with what you have taught us and increase us in knowledge, O Lord of the world. Ameen. First, I would like to thank all of you for attending tonight and for coming out to hear any words of benefit that I may be able to impart this evening. As we know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever takes out on a path seeking knowledge, then Allah will make easy for him a path to Jannah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make each and every one of your paths to Jannah easy from this evening and until the rest of your lives. So my name is Joe Bradford. I am uh, living and working in the greater Houston area in Texas. I am a graduate of the University of Medina, and I have been working in the area of finance for the last decade. I wanted to speak to you tonight <clears throat> about a few points that I think are important for us as a Muslim community to remember. Now, um, we, do, or we are going to have another lecture tomorrow morning with the seminary students on the history of Islamic finance. This evening, I want to give some broad principles of character uh, and akhlaq that the Muslim should have in order to be successful financially and remain within the realm of halal. The first and foremost principle that we have to live by as Muslims is found in the hadith that every single one of us should know or we should be familiar with. If we want to remain financially successful, if we want to remain people that are cognizant of how we earn our wealth, where we spend our wealth, and how our wealth is used, then we have to have our correct niyyah. We have to have a proper intention. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ امْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ This hadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, where the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he said, actions or by intention. And everyone will have what they intended. So whomever's, whoever's hijrah or migration was to Allah and His Messenger, then they will have Allah and His Messenger. And whoever's migration was for some wealth that they were seeking to earn, or some woman they were seeking to marry, then they will have that which they migrated for. Al-Imam al-Bukhari, he made this the very first hadith in his Sahih. And Imam al Nawawi made this the very first hadith in his 40 hadith. And this is because all actions in Islam require two things they require a correct niyyah and they require, they requ they require uh, to be, they are required to be in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So if we are going to be people that are living in society, there has to be something that differentiates us between ourselves and the rest of creation. There has to be something that differentiates us as humans from the rest of creation. And there has to be something that differentiates us as Muslims from the rest of creation. And if that one thing has to be our niyyah, because we find that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at many times speaking about the ways of those that reject his message and do not live in accordance with his laws and his dictates, he says, Inhum kal an'ami balhum adal. They are like animals. No, they're even more astray. So it all starts if you want to be a person who is successful in using their wealth in consuming their wealth and allowing their wealth to be good for themselves and for others, you have to think to yourself, number one, why am I earning it? Number two, what am I spending it on? And number three, what is the legacy that I'm leaving behind from those things that I've spent on? The Prophet ﷺ says that one of you die, <clears throat> when one of you dies, that everything leaves him except for three things. <clears throat> Some beneficial knowledge that people take advantage of. Or a righteous child who makes dua for you. Or a charity given in perpetuity. A charity which continues and continues on and on after your life. In order for you to have those three things, you have to have had a proper aniyah. You have to have been a productive person. Whether that productivity was in teaching people Islam, or that productivity was in teaching people how to deal with, their modern world, with the modern world and with their daily lives. The Prophet wasallam he said, أَنْفَعُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ the most beneficial of people are those of most benefit to others. Commenting on this hadith, the scholars have said, and from amongst the most beneficial things to mankind after the sciences or the disciplines of faith are the disciplines of engineering and medicine. And alhamdulillah, we have no shortage of engineers and doctors in our community. Alhamdulillah. And this shows that the Muslim community is very concerned not only with their own well-being, but the well-being of those around them so you have to be a productive person if you want to be productive you have to have a, pro a correct niya if you want to have a child that leave that you leave behind as a legacy then you have to raise that child with the proper niya you have to instruct them and give them the proper education that they need you have to make sure that they understand that they are carrying on a legacy after you and lastly if you want to leave a charity in perpetuity then you have to be a person that is productive in and of themselves, that generates a surplus, a surplus of time, a surplus of wealth, some form of surplus that others can benefit from and that can be carried on from after you. While I was a student in Medina, I got, I got a call from one of my friends. <clears throat> he said, I want you to go and have iftar this Ramadan at my family's sufra, my family's iftar spread in the Masjid al Nabawi. I said, sure, I'll, I'll go. So the first night, I actually, you know, when you're in Medina and as you're walking, mashallah, people are pulling you, they're trying to make you sit, so I didn't make it. So he called me that night. You didn't make it to the sufra. I said, How, you're in Jeddah. How do you even know? He said, I know, brother. I want you to make it there the next night. So when I started, why is this so important to you? Why, why are you insisting on this? He said, this is a tradition that we have kept in our family for the last 700 years. He's from the Ashraf. He's from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, my great, 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 great grandfather had once did a very good business deal and made a lot of money and he took a large portion of that money and he invested it in an endowment to fund iftar in Medina only. And it is running until today. 
And so alhamdulillah, we've, we've been able to give iftar for thousands, if not more, of people that come every single year, and we want you to be one of those people. The point in this story is, if you want to have success in this life and the next, you want to be wealthy in this life and in the next, then it starts with correcting your intention. Al-Imam ibn Qudama al-Hanbali, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of the Hanbali madhab, <clears throat> he says in his summary of Minhaj al-Qasidin, Minhaj al-Qasidin was written by Imam ibn al-Jawzi, which was a summary of Imam, Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya Ulum al-Din. He says that on the day of judgment, you should look at every hour of your life like a treasure chest. And that treasure chest can, be, can have three things in it on the day of judgment when it is opened for you in front of Allah. You can fill it with gold, and so on the day of judgment, you'll be very wealthy. You can fill it with coal, and so on the day of judgment, you'll be very sad. Or you can fill it with nothing, and on the day of judgment, you will be full of regret. So have an intention for every single hour, every single minute, and every single second of your life. So that on the day, in this life and the next, you can see the success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you. So it's a good practice for you now to think to yourself, what are the three things that I value the most in this life? What are the three things that I value the most? Write those down. And every single day, remind yourself of those things that you value and work towards them. Because if you don't have them in mind and you don't work towards them, then as the Prophet ﷺ said, من وجد خيرا فليحمد الله. Whoever finds good after his actions, let him praise Allah. ومن وجد غير ذلك فلا يلومن إلا نفسه. And whoever finds other than this, than this, then he can only blame himself. So you have to make conscious decisions about every single time and thing in your life. And through that niyyah, insha'Allah ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, <coughs> that whoever intended Allah and His Messenger will have Allah and His Messenger. Another principle that we should abide by when talking about our wealth and our spending is as the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned, it's narrated in Sunan ibn Majah with a Hassan Isnad, insha'Allah. مَنْ بَاعَ دَارًا وَلَمْ يَجَعَلْ ثَمَنَهُ فِي مِثْلِهِ فَحَرِيٌّ أَلَّا يُبَارِكَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فِيهِ The Prophet ﷺ, he said, whoever sold his home and didn't take the price and invest it in something similar to it, then it is more likely that Allah will not bless him in that thing that he invested in. O kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now think about this. In medieval Arabia, in the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, one of the main prized possessions that a person could have would be a home. And in medieval Southern California, it is still having a home, correct? One of the main things that you build equity in is your home. One of the main things that's considered part of the quote-unquote American dream is owning a home. Now imagine that someone comes to you and they say, they say, Nu'man, I have the best idea ever. Sell your house and we'll take the money and we'll invest it in a halal cart that we're going to walk up and down Bria Sin. Is that how you say the road? <laughs> That's how I, re I read it. And you say, great. But is the amount of equity in your home needed to just open up a halal food cart? No. So if somebody comes and tells you spend half a million dollars on a simple food cart, there's lack of parity in these investments. So if you're not wisely managing your money and making sure that your family is cared for and they have a stable domicile that they can feel safe and secure in, whether you're renting or whether you're buying, 
They don't have a stable domicile that they feel secure in that's holding your family's wealth. And you're taking that and putting it in investments or spending it wastefully then it is more likely that you will not be blessed in those things that you are spending it on or are investing in. So the message in this hadith is the wealth that we have, we have to use wisely. Your net worth, you have to use wisely. Don't allow yourself to make foolish decisions about your own finances. And foolish decisions are made two ways. The first type of foolish decision that we make is that we make, <clears throat> we leave off opportunities that are available to us because of our fear of the unknown and our fear of the haram. So say, for example, someone might be working in a, in a company, then they may say to themselves, I'm not sure, but I heard that my 401k is haram, therefore I'm not going to invest in it never exploring the options that their employer has for them or how they can allow that to be a halal investment for themselves. So they, they, they leave money on the table because most employers, if you invest in a 401k, what do they do? They match your funds. So if you put in $100 a month, they will put in $100 a month. Dollar to dollar up to a certain percent and then after that, uh, less than that or it's capped. Now a lot of people, they will say, well, I heard, or I think, or I'm not sure that there are haram things involved in that. Don't stop there. Don't be foolish and think and build a decision, a life-changing decision on an assumption. Allah says, assumptions do nothing in the face of the truth. Make an educated decision for yourself. Don't be foolish in allowing opportunities to go away because of fear of the haram. And the second is, don't allow yourself to invest in things which you don't understand. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So if we're talking about your wealth, the one way that you build wealth is by looking at your income, building a surplus, and having that build up over time. What is one of the reasons why we pay zakah? One of the reasons why we pay zakah. It's a command, of course, first and foremost. Because you've become wealthy. So why do you pay zakah? To purify your wealth, but also? When you have to, but why? They say you have to ask why five times to get to the true why, right, Sheikh Norman? Right? Surplus. Because it's a surplus. But what happens if you have that surplus and you don't take anything out of it? It accumulates and it accumulates and it accumulates. And there's no minimum amount of spending or charity in society. So zakat mandates that there is at least a minimum amount of assistance that goes to the poor and the needy whom you are building your life's worth off of. Because we don't realize it, but every single thing, anyone who makes more than someone else is actually building on the wealth of others. Because if there was no one there to deliver goods to the stores, if there was no one there to cut the lawn, that would be taken away from your time, right? So either you take away from your time or you take away from your wealth. So when we give zakah, we make sure that there's a safety net for the bottom rung of society and for social and societal needs. So in order to, ha to pay zakah, what do you have to have? Surplus. In order to have a surplus, what do you have to have? Income. In order to have income, what do you have to have? Hmm? Well, income is, is it, it, it becomes wealth. You have to have a job. In order to have a job, what do you have to have? You have to have a skill. You have to have education, right? So before we talk about an entire pillar of Islam, let's talk about educating our community. Before we talk about how much people are giving, let's talk about how much we've given back to the community. 
how much we've prepared our children to become one of those three things that we leave behind. A righteous child that makes dua for you. Or a charity left in perpetuity. Or some knowledge that's left behind. Notice, knowledge, intellectual, right? Charity in perpetuity, sadaqa jariya, right? It's financial. A child that makes dua for you is social. You're affecting all spheres of life. When you have an intention, and when you manage your wealth properly, after that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you have to in, in, ingrain in yourself and your children the importance of education and the importance of work and the importance of time, of putting in time. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ By time, mankind is in a loss. And that only comes about for, through you trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you put in the effort, that He will reward you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لَوْ تَوَكَّلْتُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوَكُّلِهِ لَرَزَقَكُمْ كَمَا يَرْزُقُ الطَّيْرِ تَغْدُ خِمَاسًا وَتَعُودُ بِطَانًا أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. If you were to rely upon Allah as He has the right to be relied upon, Notice, he has the right to be relied upon in this way. Then he would sustain you as he sustains the birds. They leave their nests in the morning with empty stomachs and they come back with full stomachs. Someone said to an Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah, what do you say about a person who says, I'm not going to work, I'm just going to sit here and wait for my rizq to come from Allah? He said, Hada rajulun jahil al -ilm. This is a person who is ignorant of the, the, the knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ was sent with. Because the Prophet ﷺ sold and bought, he traded, and he was a principal, and he was an agent. And he entered into partnerships. And he, did, and he worked in the marketplace, and he worked as a shepherd. He went out and he worked. And they said, what do you say about this hadith? They asked him, well, what about this hadith? We should just rely upon him like the birds. He said, did you not notice the end of the hadith? They leave their nests and then they come back. Sometimes we don't think of the effort that it takes to be able to build a legacy. We want it to come to us easily, but sometimes all it takes is us to put our first foot forward. I'll tell you a story about a very successful brother that I know. This brother was incarcerated at one time. And you know that people who are incarcerated have very difficult times finding jobs afterwards. And he accepted Islam, but because of his past history was unable to get a job. So no corporate jobs, or nobody wanted to hire him. So he became a door-to-door -door salesman. And in six months, he became the top salesman on his team. And within one year, the top salesman in the company until he was given a nationwide position. And we asked him, SubhanAllah, brother, how, did, how do you do this? He said, brother, I have a very simple principle. I wake up in the morning, I pray salat, I make my dhikr, I drink my coffee, I put my right foot out the, the front door, I say, Bismillah, and I roll, and the rest is on Allah. He said, and that's every single day. But notice, put the right foot first, Take the effort. Wealth only comes from a surplus times time. And a surplus only comes <coughs> from income. But income minus what? Spending. But you have to put the first foot forward to be able to create an, in, an income, to become independent. It's extremely important that we invigorate and revive the entrepreneurial spirit in our community. And alhamdulillah, we have many people that are successful entrepreneurs and doing a lot of great things in the community. It's extremely important that we stress the importance of financial independence, and especially for our young students that are going through faith-based religious studies, that we equip them with the skills that they need to be successful in life. And this is one of the one places in the nation I can say that does that, alhamdulillah. Institute of Knowledge is one of the one places in the nation that I can say with confidence that that is part and parcel of 
the program. So Fian al-Thawri, the great scholar of Islam, of hadith and of fiqh, he was asked, why do we see you out in the marketplace doing business, buying and selling? Aren't you worried that this money is going to distract you? And he told the person, uskut, quiet. لَوْلَ هَذِهِ الدَّرَاهِمْ لَتَمَنْدَلَ بَيْنَا الْأُمَرَاءِ if it weren't for these darahim, if it weren't for this money, then the, le the, the rulers would come and wipe their hands with us. So when you have financial independence, you can, you can be effective in life. Notice the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. When Yusuf alayhi salam was in the jail, what was the first thing that those two people saw and said to him in the jail? I know there are a lot of half of the of Quran in the audience, so you'll have to com you'll have to complete it for me. What did no, 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 look in the cell phone, right? What did they say to him? Inna la naraka min al muhsinin. We see you to be a person of excellence, a person of ihsan, a person who has something to give. So when you have something to give, people are naturally attracted to that. Why, would, why was the Prophet ﷺ naturally, why were the people naturally attracted to the Prophet ﷺ? Because he had something to give. He was a Sadiq al Amin. And tomorrow night, inshallah ta'ala, at uh, the Islamic Center of Irvine, we're going to talk about those characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ, a Sidq and al Amana, and the ethics that we should have as entrepreneurs and businessmen and employees. But, <coughs> but he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a sadiq al amin People were attracted to him for those things that he was able to do because of his independence. So when you have skills and you have earnings, what's the next thing that you need to do to be financially successful? Is not spend it all in one night. You have to have a budget. Somebody says, what is all of the stuff that you're talking to, about, uh, talking to us about? Budgets aren't found in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Are they? Yes, they are. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَوْ كَانَ لِي مِثْلُ أُحُدٍ ذَهَبًا لَمَا لَبِثَ فِي بَيْتِ ثَلَاثَ لَيَالٍ إِلَّا وَأَنْفَقْتُهُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ If I were to have the entirety of Mount Uhud of gold in my home, I would not allow three nights to pass except that I had given it all out for the sake of Allah. Illa, except. Shayun arsuduhu ridain. Except for some that I save to pay off debts. Notice, the Prophet ﷺ was thinking about what he may incur in the future. He didn't say he had debts, but he may have a debt. So he saved a little bit. He budgeted for himself, Right? So not only working and relying upon Allah and putting the effort forward, but also having a financial plan for yourself, thinking about where you'll be in the future. Number one question that I'm asked when, when I do advisory services for people, the number one question that I'm asked is, I don't know what to do. My child, 17, 18, 19 years old, going to college, and I have no way to help them whatsoever. And I'm afraid that they're going to fall into the haram and, and, and have to take out loans. What do I do? So if a, there's a Chinese proverb, what does it say? The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today, right? So if you're not planning for your future, regardless of your age, then start to think about the surplus that Allah has given you and what you want to do with it, not just in this life for your own benefit, but also in the next life. What do you want to be said about you after you died? Henry Ford, everyone know Henry Ford, right? Founder of the Ford Motor Company. He has a beautiful statement. They asked him, why do you make quick decisions on your own? And he said, because no city has ever built a statue of a committee. No city has ever built a statue of a committee. So sometimes you have to think, what am I leaving behind for the future generations? How will I be remembered in dua? Where will my children be? And how happy will they be with me 
in preparing them to be one of those three things that I left behind? What will my community think of me? How will they make dua for me? <coughs> so my suggestion is if you don't have a budget, do not go and get an app. Do not get an app. There are a lot of apps. And I'll suggest some to you. But for one month, I want you to do this. I want you to get a pen and paper. Okay? And I want you to write down every single thing that you own. I'm sorry, everything, every single thing that you, that you earn and every single thing that you spend. It's difficult, but do it for one month. Write it down, pencil and paper. Why? Because when it's physically in front of you and you're doing the math yourself, you're going to say to yourself, I, I am spending a little bit too much on coffee. Right? I could have, you know, I was, I wanted to give that $5 they asked for after Juma, but I didn't have it with me because I had spent it already. Or you know what? I could reasonably save $200 a month and put that into a college fund for my child. But I'm not doing that. When you have it physically in front of you, then you can follow that sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Give and give generously, yes, but also plan for your future. <coughs> when you're planning, after you know your income, you know what you're spending, the number one thing after that for your, for your budget is get rid of your debt. Many of us carry large amounts of debt. Roll it over to the next month, credit card debt, right? We have bills, right? The very first thing you need to do is get rid of debt. Pay off your debts. And you may say to yourself, but no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm saving my money and I'm investing it. Guess what? Let's just say that you have a very good credit card that only charges you 10%, yes, salam, only 10% interest on your credit card, right? Many of them charge 15, 20, 25. Let's just say it's 10. And let's just say as well <coughs> that your investments right now, the stock market is really only earning at tops 3%. Okay? Let's just say, for the sake of argument, how much are you earning monthly if your investments are earning 3% and you're paying 10% interest? How much are you really earning? Negative 7, right? So you think I'm investing, I'm doing good, but you're not. In actuality, you're putting yourself further into a hole. Pay off your interest-bearing debts first. You are effectively giving yourself a positive a point seven or a seven-point lead into the future by not having to pay that much more interest into the future. <coughs> so pay yourself first. The next thing that you need to do is plan out your giving. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَا نَقَصَ مَالٌ مِنْ صَدَقَةٌ Your wealth was never diminished because of charity. Sadaqa actually doesn't mean charity. Linguistically, sadaqa comes from the same root word as sidq. It shows some honesty and truthfulness from yourself. It shows that you have a duty to your fellow man. It shows that you care enough to make sure that others are cared for. for. <coughs> And as we know that the Prophet والسلام, especially in Ramadan, was min nas. He was of the most generous of people. And he was very giving. But as we see, he also planned for himself and for his family. And what I advocate for each and every one of you is to have a wise giving plan. Meaning, don't take all of your money that you've earned here and never give back to the community that you live in. And we do that two ways. Number one, by not supporting our local institutions. And number two, by not supporting non-Muslims in our area. Many times we think that they're not worthy. But if they're not worthy, then who is? If they're not worthy, and they can't see the light of Islam through you helping them through difficulty, then what's the purpose of claiming to be a Muslim. We have to be beneficial to all of those around us, our community, and the broader community. So we have to, what I advocate for, now I know what you're saying, there are many crises 
throughout the world. First and foremost, one that's not in anyone's mind, Central African Republic. After that, Rohingya. After that, Syria. After that, Hadith Bimashit. There, there, there are many others. We have a lot of crises that are happening around the Muslim world. What I advocate for is that you look at the different types of sadaqah that you have to or you can give throughout the, the year. So personally, I now make a conscious decision never to do udhiya or qurbani in the United States. And I'll tell you why. Because when you take a huge bag of raw meat to someone's house, they open up their freezer and they say, we already got food stamps. We, 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 have, we have food. Can you pay my electricity bill? I, I, don't need, I don't need the food, but thank you very much. It's going to go to waste because my house is small and I have a small refrigerator. I can't take all of this meat, right? But if you slaughtered a cow or a camel or a sheep or a goat somewhere overseas, that one sheep might feed an entire village. It might feed an entire refugee camp. This is my personal opinion, and I'm not telling you this is what you should do. But look at the ways that you can make your zakah and your sadaqah and your zakat al-fitr and your udhiya and your kafara and your general sadaqah. How can you make it most effective for yourself and for the ummah and for your community? So personally, my zakat al-mal, I use it locally. Zakat al-fitr, a portion of it local, a portion of it overseas. Udhiya, qurbani, aqiqa almost always overseas, where I know that, mashallah, every single trace of the animal is going to be used. Every single trace. Anyone who's lived overseas and see, seen how, alhamdulillah. Over here, Allah musta'an, you go to the maslakh, you go to the, the slaughterhouse, right? And this is wasted and that, that is wasted, right? Unfortunately, we've lost the, the ingenuity of the early American pioneers where nothing was wasted. But overseas, alhamdulillah, everything is generally cared for. <coughs> but I advocate that you look at every single form of sadaqah that you can give, whether it's zakah, zakat al-futr, qurbani, whatever it is, and find where it can be most effective and then spend it in that way. And don't forget your local Muslim institutions, even if it's something that you can give $5 a month. How many people are here right now? Let's say somebody says, well, what, is, what good is my $5 going to do? $5 a month from 100 people on Juma is what? $500 a week times four? I might be in finance. I'm not good with, good with math. So you guys have to, what, five, 500 times four? 2000 $2,000 a month coming into an institution like IOK, coming into an institution like a local Islamic center, Right? <coughs> That does a lot to help with those who they are helping. And it does a lot to help with the basic, exp basic expenses. And it does a lot to help build an endowment, a waqf, so where you do not have to give. We have a problem in our community. And that alhamdulillah, we have many affluent people in our community. But that affluence brings about a certain arrogance. And that we think that because I have a very large salary, I don't need to help the organization's plan long term. We shouldn't have to do fundraisers every Ramadan. We should just have, you know, Laylatul Qadr only, not Laylatul Qadr and Laylatul Mal. It should just be Laylatul Qadr, right? It should just, just be for dua, right? Not for fundraising. But that takes us building communities that understand this issue understanding our goal and understanding that we don't want to have to give every single year because we want to do what we mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture and that is leave one of leave these three things what was the third one a charity in perpetuity meaning that if i can give a thousand dollars two thousand dollars five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars once and that remains until the end of time why wouldn't i that is, a, that is a business deal that no one would give up on. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us in the Quran. 
What's the one, what's the one, what is the largest financial sin in Islam? Riba. What is riba equivalent to? Then, then be, be alerted of a war from Allah and His Messenger. Right? But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us in the Quran, what logic does He use with us when giving? What's the rest? Who will give Allah a good loan so that He may multiply it? tenfold or manyfold. Allah is using the logic of riba with you to encourage you to give because he knows that our, psycho our, our psychology is that we like to take but we don't like to give. Right? We like to take but we don't like to give. They say there was a man, a very rich man. He was drowning and a boat came by and someone said, Give me your hand. He said, no, I'm fine. He's drowning again. I can't swim, I can't swim. Somebody said, give me your hand. He said, I'm fine. Third boat saw the first two boats come by. He said, take my hand. He, said, he took his hand and he was safe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us in terms that speak to our psyche. In the insana khuliqa halua. Man was created with this instability, this fear of losing. So, when you give, plan for your giving. <clears throat> and then seventh, the seventh point, and the last point, is that know that in planning and income and spending and budgeting and investing to take that surplus that you have of your income minus your spending and invest it, understand that there are no black boxes. There's nothing that you can, you know, a machine that you can stick a check in and then more money comes out. It doesn't work like that. If you have that friend that says, give me money now and I guarantee you a 99.9% .9 increase, right? It's probably not true. If, it's, if, it's, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably not true. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to go to those people of expertise in their areas or to become people of expertise if we want to speak or work in a certain area. Allah says, ask the people of remembrance, the people of expertise, the scholars of fiqh and specifically in the area of qada, they mention that this verse is a fundamental evidence in the use of expert witnesses in court cases that you should always go to an expert in their field to determine what is right and what is wrong. And if you don't want to go to an expert, then you should become an expert. But you should not make haphazard decisions. The Prophet ﷺ was walking through Medina and he saw people, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, he saw people pollinating their date palms. Do you guys get dates in the palm trees that are here? You do? How do they come, do you, can you actually eat them or do they just come out bad? They're shis, huh? So in Arabic, when the, bait, the date palm comes out, that you can't eat the dates, it's called, it's called shis. When they come out ripe, they're called balah. But if they come out bad, they're called shis. That's because the pollination was bad. There's something that got mixed up. Do you have pine trees here? You have pine trees? No? What other trees do you have? So some cross-pollination usually, okay? So that happens in Florida as well, where I'm from where you have cross-pollination between these so that it comes out bad, except for in the very southern tip of Florida where the dates actually grow quite nice because there are no, palm, there are no pine trees, there's only palm trees. Point being, the Prophet ﷺ saw them pollinating tr the trees. How did they pollinate the trees? They take, <coughs> they take a portion of the male tree and they wrap it inside a portion of the female tree and it's pollinated. The Prophet ﷺ said, what if you left it? He just asked them a question. What if you left it? They thought this was a command from him, so they left it. That year they had a very low uh, harvest of dates. So when they came to the Prophet, they said, we had, we, you told us to leave it, we had a very low 
harvest the dates. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Antum a'lam wishuni dunyakum. You all know the affairs of your dunya better. I was only asking a question. What a what if question. But if you left it, what would happen? But because of their reverence and their deference to the Prophet ﷺ, they didn't follow up. Notice the difference between this and the day of, say, Badr. And the name of the Sahabi is escaping me right now, if any of you recall it. Who was the Sahabi who questioned the Prophet ﷺ placement of the armies, placement of the battalions? Was it Rib'i? Habab ibn Mundir. Habab ibn Mundir said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Awahyun ya Rasulullah, am harbun wa makida. Is this revelation, O Messenger of Allah? Or is this part of the stratagem of war? He said, Bel, harbun wa makida. This is the stratagem of war. He said, in that case, your strategy is wrong. Put your battalions over there. Cut them off from the water. Right? But not all of them, not all of the Sahaba had the bravery, the audacity, right, to ask that question. So that's what happened in this hadith. The point being is that if you're going to deal with something which needs expertise, you have to do one of two things. Speak to an expert or educate yourself until you become an expert. But never go and throw your money into an investment or even into a community project and it's not clear. And this happens all the time in our community. We have projects that come up we're raising money for something we don't really know what we're raising for and in the end of the day we have a huge burden on the community to take care of that whatever it is that's built or made afterwards so if we're going to invest in our akhirah through sadaqah or in our dunya through investments then we should understand it be the expert or go to <coughs> the experts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and I'll close with this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam قُلْ لَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبِ لَسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَمَا مَسَلْ يَسُّوءُ Say to them, O Muhammad, if I truly knew the unseen, that I would only gather good for myself and nothing bad would ever touch me. Al-Imam al-Tabari commenting on this hadith said, I would gather crops during good years and store them for the bad years. And I would buy things when prices were low and save them for the times when prices were high. Right? So there is a logic to every single thing that you do. There's a logic to investment. There's a logic to, <coughs> to employment. There are rules and there are sunan that you should follow. And if you don't follow those rules of expertise, then you'll find later on that you will be at a disadvantage. Many times in Houston, where I live, uh, we are a big oil and gas town, right? Big oil and gas town. So everybody says, oh, Houston, I live in Houston, oil and gas, I'm going to go and invest it in oil and gas. I, had a, I know somebody said, I put you know, uh, $50,000 into oil and gas. I lost it the next day. I said, well, why did you do that? Oh, my friends told me it was a good investment. Okay, but they tell you what to invest in, when to invest, why to invest, which companies, upstream, midstream, downstream, Services. What? What were you going to invest in? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I just thought to invest. Right? Don't be that person. Be a person that when you invest, you have a niyyah. You have an intention. Number two, you understand your projected earnings and your projected losses. And number three, you have a budget and a plan for sustaining that and allowing it to be built. أقول ما تسمعون وجزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك الشهر ولا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك That's all I have to share with you this evening I'd be glad to field any questions if Sheikh Nurman will allow me Of course all questions are 995 and uh, every question after